interview with Dr. Umar Johnson, and he was speaking on you know several good topics. And I'm a huge Dr. Umar Johnson fan. I love um, um, he's inspired me with a lot of things over the years, and I love a lot of the issues he covered, and very much been inspired with you know the Frederick Douglass Academy that he's creating. But I think he was dead ass wrong on the the, the comments he made about Deion Sanders. One of the biggest things that you know he was kept pushing is that you know it it was a bit it was a great idea for him to stay there, bring in former NFL coaches, and that would inspire black athletes to go to HBCUs and to be able to uh, uh, go to the NFL and do things like that instead of going to PWIs or Power Five schools with doing that. And I think he's totally you know uh, uh, wrong, absolutely wrong with it. And even just the vantage point he's trying to look at it. I think one of the problems that people have is that not understanding the, the business dynamic with a lot of things. Um, and again, I think that's a very, very sharp brother. But one thing about it, you know, and I think we just need to start here first, and I speak on this a lot, uh, HBCU's problem is not funding from the government or, you know, athletes not coming. HBCU's main financial problem is that uh, anywhere from 10 to 12 percent is the, you know, annual donation rate from HBCU alumni to HBCU's. That's one of the damn reasons why HBCUs are having financial problems. Because uh, I had a son to play, you know, Division One football, SEC ball, and I remember just touring different schools, not even just SEC schools, Big 12 schools. You see these family names that have donated and, and done these things. And the same thing, they go along, go with HBCUs. But it can be done on a bigger scale. And when I say that, you know, I talk about this on the other video, I mean, you can get 100, uh, uh, 100 alumni from HBCU to donate $10,000 a year. A hundred people is not a lot. You think about the grand scheme of, uh, of people. That's your million dollars. And they can be more than that. But when you got 10 to 12%, you can Google this as far as the alumni donation rate. Now, you, you know, let's not look at your your Morehouses, your Howards, your Spellmans. That's a different endowment. But we're talking about the vast majority of them. They're not donating back to the schools. And that's the damn issue. Of course, you can get money from the government and everything like that. That's fine. But until you, we start taking care of our own stuff, that's when the issues come up. One of the things I think Dr. Umar was looking at with just the former NFL coaches coming back coaching, uh, yeah, I understand that too. I think no guy, you know, I don't, you know, he, even though, I think, like again, it's coach speak. When I say coaches come and say, hey, I love this job, I'm here, I'm happy. That's every coach. That's coach speak. That's not even attached to a color. We talk about again, you know, in the video, I don't necessarily know if Dion was the most popular hire coming to Jackson, <laughs> to come uh, to Jackson State. You know, when you start looking at some of the past videos and stuff like that, I think people were happy, but I think people still looking like, you know, why we get this guy, we probably some more other qualified black coaches that we could hire. Dion got there, a little bumpy at first, and after a while it turned to success, which is awesome. But when we start talking about, you know, him cooning or him selling out his people or pushing certain things, I, 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 I just think it's regular coach speak. Every coach does that. Black, blue, gray, green, and yellow. When kids come to a school, you know, again, I'm speaking from a parent, and I've been through that, it's it, it's not uncommon for your kid to go through four or five different position coaches. It, it, it's not, because that, that, that's the kind of career that is. They're only going to be there two, three, four years, right? Dion could have easily, easily had back-to-back -back losing seasons, and they would have fired him. That's just how that business goes. It's kind of like on average, you know, most coaches at a school, you know, on average probably four or five years, if that. You know, that's you just to get a class through. But I think we start pushing, selling out, and your people going there, or kids getting turned down, you know, kids is coming there for the coach and they getting sold at, that's the business. And that's any school your kid can go to, any school your kid can go to. If a coach, coaches are constantly going to be progressive. You, when you have coaches that are at a place that's that quote unquote, you know, they're going to be entrenched there for forever, um, that's, that's a small percentage of coaches, a small percentage of coaches that are, that are, that are locked in. Most of them are trying to get, you know, progressing, progressing, progressing. And then you may have your, your Nick Saban, you know, they've been there for God knows how long. You have your Joe Paternos and those kind of people that are locked in forever at, at a school. That's, that's a small percentage of coaches. Most coaches are going to say the same thing. They can't recruit saying I'm going to leave in two or three years, you know, with, uh, uh, with the hopes of your child coming to that school. You know, God knows. I my son's coach, who I love him to death. You know, he was awesome, awesome guy. I love him. My mom always defend him. He sat on my sofa, told me he wasn't going anywhere. You know, two or three years in, he headed to Penn State, and I'm just sitting there like, hey man, I can't knock it, and I understand that's the business. But that's one of the things people got to understand when 
those particular things happen, you know, you have to make sure that, you know, you and your child on, on board with it. And that's just the business of that, you know, people uh, moving there. But when we start talking about bringing in money, bringing in revenue and things like that, I don't think people look at it, you know, the, the right way. To just say, okay, Dion, you know, had done so much and he changed the narrative with, with uh, businesses and with kids coming in and stuff like that. I think he gave everybody a solid blueprint. And he's not doing anything different that another coach can't come in. I think what he what he pushed to coaches, and he said it in interviews, he can say some things that probably some of the other coaches can't say, more so saying that uh, he didn't have prop, uh, some of the coaches may not have the leverage uh, to say certain things without probably fear of losing their job. I but a lot of times you can get coaches in. I mean, cause even with Jackson State now, you're in a better position you were than you were a couple of years ago. Now the onus on you is to get you a good coach that can bring in good athletes and also know how to leverage out different relationships from a corporate, community uh, aspect to be able to grow it. And make sure your alumni, you give them some damn money. That's the thing I think keeps getting missed. I'm here in Atlanta, you know, and uh, Marsh Brown, awesome, you know, awesome college. Close. It, it closed uh, when they lost their accreditation years. It didn't close. I'm sorry. It lost their accreditation and, and for years. They just got everything back, and I think they went up with tick. But I I don't know how long this has been. This may be 15, 20 years. They were out of their damn accreditation. And and I understand the, the, you know, in regards to, you know, hearing things about people stealing money and everything. And I, and I, and I, uh, I know information came out that somebody in the accounting office was taking money and misappropriating funds. I get that part. But still ain't no way in hell when I look at a school like a Mars Brown in Atlanta, they couldn't get enough alumni to pool the resources. And I understand people like I'm tired of losing money, spending money. I get that. I get that. And not, and you're not telling me that doesn't happen at, at every university. That's not a black college thing, right? That's an every university thing. You got people that around money, they get sticky fingers and stuff. You know, that happens everywhere. But at the end of the day, to let stuff close, that's a whole different dynamic. So I say this again. When you start looking again, 10 to 12%. Is donating back to their school, that's the damn problem. Not necessarily a person coming in. I think Dion did a lot of, you know, again, could he done some things differently? I don't know. That's just, that's just that business. That's just that business. When you're a coach, uh, uh, and it's just the same thing with the kids. You got to make the decision that's best for you. And sometimes people say, well, you know, do it for the people, don't do it for the money. The hell? I'm just, okay. It, it, it amazes me what people say when they're not in them certain kind of position. That's just like when I hear people a lot of times when I talk on my videos about people where they talk about generational wealth and building certain things. I think it's easy to say that until you get to that point. And then you've built this money up and your kids growing up and they don't even give a damn about the business or the money. And now you say, here you spend all this time in your life trying to save this money. And now you're like, okay, I sacrificed this with my vision. But your vision, your children's vision may be totally different. And I think that's what it is a lot of times. When things don't necessarily go our way or we don't feel like they're happening in the direction we want to go in, then we want to start blaming folks and things. Some it, it just doesn't work like that. It's nothing wrong with you sometimes being with you being selfish. You can be selfish and still love your people and take care of your people. I think at the end of the day, if he's still getting kids in college, make sure they're getting educated. Black young men in college getting educated, they graduating and stuff like that. The end game is still the end game. The end game is still the end game, and that's young black men graduate from college. Uh, and it may be able to be more impactful where he is right now. Now, that I don't know because now you can probably bring in other coaches to end that are black and, you know, put them in a position where they're making higher wages, where they're making more of a, a bigger impact on a bigger scale. Um, even with, with Dion getting hired, one thing I uh, I didn't bring up out in the video I talked about before, um, when I was talking about both sides, one, again, you still look at it even when he came to Jackson State, guys. And this is what kind of gives me all the hoopla with every damn thing. When he was hired, Dion had no college coaching experience. And there were a lot of brothers, uh, qualified brothers, that he was hired above because I guess Jackson State took a chance on him. Hey, you know, and, and they won. I, I feel like they got the best out of that investment by taking a chance on Dion. But there were some qualified brothers that were skipped ahead of Dion, right? And just like now when he went to Colorado, there are some qualified brothers that were skipped ahead of Dion. And, and, and like I said, I don't know if he was interested in the job or not. But you think about probably one of the probably one of the best outside of Cordell Stewart, probably one of the uh, uh, best players in Colorado history, Eric Enemy. He's been sitting there in the pros trying to get a head coaching job for years. I mean, he's a legend in Colorado on the national championship team. I don't know if they entertained it. I don't even know if he was interested in it or not. But I'm just saying there are guys that probably had a whole lot better 
uh, uh, more qualifications rather brothers that still were looking past uh, 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 they were skipped over because of Dion I apologize so with that said it's just one of them things to happen and I think that if we focus more on what the brother did do I think that you know it'll help us out a lot more going forward because again I love Dr. Umar and I think he, you know uh, he has a lot of great information for us but one thing I do want to, you know, talk about, we start talking about this guy cooning, this guy doing this, she's selfish. I think a lot of brothers need to sit their ass down in front of each other and have a conversation. Because I really, until I talk to you, I really don't know what you, you know, I can I can listen to a 30-second clip. I can look at certain interviews, just a piece of it, and, and, and pull what I want to pull from it. But a lot of times, I think, and I think some of these guys do have access to have a conversation where they make a pick up the phone or something, even they can't meet face to face, just have a conversation. I'm not real cool with black men calling each other out without having a conversation first. You know, I'm not saying nobody is, you know, is, is excluded from any kind of criticism or anything like that. But I'm saying this is not the way to go about everything in regards to always chastising and judging each other in public and you didn't really have a conversation. Because you might have took something out of context, depending on what you heard. Some stuff might just be black and white. He said what he said. But far too often when you get a brother, especially with, you know, uh, polarizing as Dr. Umar. Well, a lot of people follow him, and he has a lot of uh, uh, blind trust. And what I mean by blind trust, no matter what he says, people aren't going to think or scrutinize. And this keeping it real, that they're just going to listen to what he says, and what he says is right. And that's not always right, you know? And, and when you're in those kind of positions, you got to be very, very careful about it and understand. That doesn't mean it's fair, but you got to be very, very careful about it. Everybody is not uh, going to use logic or reasoning when they listen to people. You know, some people just because you said it, that means it's right. And and a lot of brothers have that. You know, especially when on that scale, they have that capacity, and that's why they got to be very, very careful. I would have thought it been suited better. Let me reach out to Dion. Anybody know how to get in contact with him? Anybody did that? I doubt it. And just have a conversation. And just felt see where that brother coming from, but it could. But, but I was just listening to him. He was talking about celebrities doing this. Celebrities are a small percentage, a very small portion of black wealth that are most recognizable, but they're a very small portion. And if we're gonna keep going into this small percentage fixing all our damn financial problem, it's crazy as hell. That's not gonna work. That's not gonna work. Trust me, the bigger percentage can do a lot more than that small percentage. You know that's that. You know honestly. And what the, the small percentage can do, they can cut a check and make an impact. I agree. But the big percentage can make a more sustained impact, right? And that's why I think we need to be moving towards, we got to get out of that 10 to 12% uh, don donating back. I think if that changes, because again, simple math, 100 alumni, 10 grand, million dollars a year. Hell, you can get 100 alumni to donate 5 grand. That's half a million dollars on a yearly basis. That's just donations. And when we start talking about these schools that have been open for hundreds of years, you mean to tell me they can't get that kind of money in? Uh, I, I don't think it'd be that difficult. We got to get away from these damn five, ten, twenty dollar damn checks or just going to the games. And the most you put into the uh, 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 your, your, your alma mater is the money you put in parking and concession. We got to get away from that. The numbers don't lie when we start looking at them kind of statistics 10 to 20 percent. That lets you know the vast damn majority of the people that attended the damn games that went to the school ain't putting nothing back into the school. That's just keeping it real. That's just keeping it real. So let's get out of what the hell other people can do for us and just take care of things we can take care of for ourselves. And and again, if, if anything, I, I, I just hope that we can, you know, have these kind of conversations in regards to if I see something that I don't like you doing or I don't think is right, you know, hey, Brother Dion, hey, Brother Umar, they can talk on the phone instead of just, you know, fronting like that because what happens is you got too many people when you have one person making a comment like this another person making a comment like that and they polarizing everybody gets so many distorted views and people not trusting any one of them and i'm not saying people don't need to be thinking but for us to be such a we'll still be minorities and we're trying to go in a certain direction trying to build this we want to get reparations want to do these certain kind of things it's hard to get people on you know on a bandwagon on a movement because people just kind of shake it because they're hearing this not saying everybody's going to be on the same page or agree with everything but again we still need to, i think we need to have close some of these doors and have conversations before we have a lot of our more powerful and popular influential i don't say leaders but people of our of our race that are out there putting stuff out there in the community i i just when i when i looked at the, the interview this morning you know again we were talking about kanye and, and i'm not a big kanye fan 
uh, and, and um, oh my God, I'm forgetting the other brother. Even with LeBron, nobody's like, nobody's like excluded from criticism. But again, I think some conversation need to be had because if the guy got a mental damn problem, he got a mental problem. I'm talking about Kanye. I mean, so you don't know what the hell gonna come out of his mouth. Um, you know, and, and, um, even with, with with Kyrie and things like that, I think sometimes people need to have conversations. Dr. Umar didn't say anything negative. You know, he was very uh, proud of Kyrie, and I, you know, and, and I am as well. But I do think you, you've had a lot of brothers that come out negatively uh, having a conversation, and they're really not informed about where the brother was coming from uh, in anything. But that's why I think sometimes people need to have conversations. And if it's nothing wrong when people ask you a question and you really don't know, we're saying, I'm not for sure on it. You don't have to give a damn opinion every time somebody asks you. If you don't know, it's nothing wrong with saying I'm not familiar on. I'm not. I'm not for sure, but I'll try to get back with you. It's nothing wrong with that. And I think we have too many people giving opinions, and giving a point of view on stuff they really don't know what the hell they're talking about. So listen again. I just want to have that quick conversation with you guys in regard to that because I thought you know Dr. Umar was very very wrong what he said about Dion uh, on the Breakfast Club interview. But uh, feel free to leave your comments and everything. You know, and thanks for all the love and support. Y'all be safe. Talk with you soon.